So let's get an expert's insights on the coronavirus, which is showing a little sign of slowing down. In fact, it's speeding up. Confirmed cases have jumped from 12,000 to 14,000 plus in the space of just 24 hours. I'm happy to say we are joined by Dr. John Campbell, a U.S. based, a U.K. based rather, independent health analyst, a medical professional who has been following the outbreak very closely since the start. John, welcome. And can you tell us more you, about the uh, coronavirus? We all know now that it's from the same family of viruses as SARS and MERS. Considering how fast this coronavirus is spreading compared to those, are people right to be as concerned as they are at the moment? Mm. Well, we've known about the coronavirus since the 1960s. It's always lived in uh, animals. And it's made the species jump from animals into humans, unfortunately, in Wuhan in China. And this has caused zoonotic infections, infections that we get from animals. And this is now spreading from person to person. So person to person spread has now been confirmed. Now, you're right to say, Mark, it is the same uh, type of virus, the same family of viruses as MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and SARS, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. It's the same family of viruses, but the virus is slightly different. It's changed in slightly different ways. And there's some interesting differences here. So the, the death rate, for example, with his novel coronavirus is probably about 2%. Whereas with SARS, it was about 10%, but with MERS, it's about 35%. So that's kind of the good news, as it were. The death rate is lower. But the bad news is that MERS is much harder to transmit. This novel coronavirus transmits more easily. And another big difference that you've already referred to in your uh, excellent piece there was that asymptomatic carriers can spread the new coronavirus. Asymptomatic means they don't have symptoms yet. They are still incubating the illness. And this was not the case with SARS. It was only sick people that could spread SARS, whereas healthy appearing people can spread the novel coronavirus. So you can catch it from friends who appear perfectly well, but yet can be carrying the virus and will become ill in the next few days because of this infectious incubation period. Yeah, and the danger is then, of course, that you can uh, be with this friend who might have the virus but isn't showing any symptoms, uh, catch it from them, and then you, you go and spread it to all your friends and family. So uh, we're going to have to see how this plays out in the coming weeks and months. But researchers have shown that the coronavirus can pass via human-to-human -human transmission, as you just mentioned. How do you think people can best protect themselves and their families? In animals, the, uh, the, the virus is often in the gastrointestinal tract, so it can be spread through feces. And that is true in humans. But the main thing that's infected in humans is the respiratory system. It's in the respiratory system. And this means that when someone coughs or sneezes, they're breathing out moisture. So you probably know that when you breathe in air, it's fairly dry. And when you breathe it out, it's actually quite moist. The air is much moister. This is because there's uh, thousands of very small droplets in the air that we breathe out. And the respiratory epithelium in an infected person has the virus and sheds the virus. So the virus will be in their mucus and in their saliva and will go up into their upper respiratory tract as well. So when they cough or sneeze or even just come into close contact with us, the virus is going to be spread into the air. It's like an aerosol of the virus in the air. It's this droplet infection. And then we can breathe that virus into our respiratory tract and that can infect us through the nose or through the mouth. And it gets into the body through mucous membranes. And of course, the front of the eyes are a mucous membrane as well. So if someone was to cough or sneeze, even up to two meters away from you, then the droplet infection with the virus, the droplets of water containing the coronavirus can get into your mouth, you can breathe it in, or it can get into your eyes. And the other main way of spread Certainly what happened with SARS was that when someone coughs or sneezes, the virus goes onto surfaces that they're um, coughing or sneezing onto. And then if you go and touch that surface with your hand, you can then pick up the virus and the virus will then be on your hand. Now, it won't go through the skin of your hand, but if you put it in your mouth or your nose or 
or your eyes, then it can get in. So it's very important to have good hand hygiene. So if we've been outside or near anyone that might be infected, thorough hand washing as you've shown in your item. Soap and water, hot water, wash the hands forward, backwards, all the different ways you can wash your hands and uh, get your hands as clean as possible. In healthcare situations, of course, we'd wear gloves to protect ourselves against the virus and then take the gloves off. So they're the main ways, the droplet infection, the the droplets and the virus getting onto surfaces. Now, how long this virus can live on surfaces is not quite clear. It depends on the temperature. So when it's cold, the virus can survive for longer. So it's probable, we don't know yet, but in SARS, it was certainly possible for the virus to live on surfaces for four, five, six days or even longer. So uh, before we have, until we get more precise data, it might be best to assume that the same is true for this virus and that it can live on surfaces for four, five or six days after someone's coughed or sneezed on it and to be absolutely meticulous about our personal hygiene. OK, yes, uh, washing hands and being very careful with uh, how you uh, take care of yourself in terms of hygiene is uh, of crucial importance at this uh, time. And you mentioned washing your hands thoroughly. I also read that uh, you should also clean under your, your fingernails uh, as well. Now, you touched upon how the mortality rate right now is standing at around 2%, uh, much lower than SARS or, or MERS, but has this... Uh, extra factor of being a lot more contagious. Just how dangerous uh, is the coronavirus if you contract it? And uh, are there more vulnerable members of society, say the very young or the very old, or those with pre-existing health conditions that we should be especially concerned about? Mm. Well, typically any infection is affecting the very young and the very old to a greater extent. So viral infections are a greater risk. So seasonal flu, for example, is a greater risk to older people. And many infections are a greater risk to young people, often below the age of two because their immune system is not fully developed. Then your immune system is well developed when you're a young fit adult, but the immune system deteriorates with increasing age, making older people at greater risk. And as well as that, older people have a greater likelihood of having other diseases, other pathologies. So, for example, if someone's got chronic obstructive airways disease and bronchitis, or they suffer from chronic asthma, or some other chest conditions, then they're going to be more prone to getting this virus because the immune systems in their chest won't be working as well. Or if someone has heart disease and they're collecting fluid in their lungs, they're going to be at greater risk. Or if someone has poorly managed diabetes mellitus, they will be at greater risk as well. That's why it's very important to manage the sugar properly in diabetes mellitus. But the good news is that so far it appears that children are less susceptible given the data that we have. So it seems that the main risk at the moment is older people and those with pre-existing medical conditions. But of course, there are plenty of examples of young fit people catching it. There's a, a recorded case that caught it from a contact from Wuhan of a 33-year-old fit German businessman who did in fact contract the virus. Right. Uh, I'd love to talk to you uh, for a lot longer, but unfortunately, uh, we are kind of running out of time. Finally, and quickly, if you, if you wouldn't mind, there has been a lot of talk that a vaccine is months, if not years away, because, of, of course, they have to do all the clinical trials before it can ever be te tested on humans. Asking you <coughs> to look into your crystal ball for a moment, if you don't mind, in, say, three months from now, do you think this is going to be a much bigger story than it is right now, or do you think it might be consigned to yesterday's newspapers? There's quite a lot of unknowns, and as you rightly say, say, Mark, vaccines are difficult to develop. And one of the reasons for that is that the virus can change. There can be mutation in the virus. Now, there was a recent paper on modelling of epidemic outbreaks, and this particular epidemic outbreak published in the Lancet just recently. And that predicted that it's likely that the maximum uh, the maximum peak of this outbreak, if things carry on in Wuhan, is likely to be in mid-April, with other cities that have been seeded by the virus, with a, a lag time about two weeks behind that. So um, by about May, this virus may well peak in other cities. What happens after that depends how, how, how people 
react themselves, the individual responsibility, individual isolation of sick people, and as we've seen in the Korean situation, the action that governments take. But there certainly is the potential here to be a pandemic, a global spread of this condition. Hopefully, most of the people will have a fairly mild disease and they'll recover normally. But as we've already said, some people are going to be more susceptible and it can be a life-threatening condition. So in six months' time, um, it could well, three months' time anyway, it could still be around and could still be infecting a lot of people. I hope not, but we have to be prepared for the worst. OK, yes, we certainly hope not. Uh, John, thanks for joining us. Uh, if you'd Pleasure, like to see Mark. more of the doctor's regular in-depth coronavirus updates and insights, uh, please check out his popular YouTube channel, Dr John Campbell, and hit subscribe. Uh, John, we appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule on a Sunday night there in the UK. Thank you very much. Pleasure, Mark. Good to talk to you.